Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. It's a super mini mail call and normally I have some packages ready to open right here, but I don't because it's on the bench right there behind me because it's really big and I'm going to be using my phone to try to stream to OBS. I'm using my Google Pixel this time, so hopefully the color balance won't be all over the place like it is when I use the iPhone for this purpose. All right, here's the package. It's, it's really, really heavy and um, let's just say that the uh, packing on this, well, I don't know if it survives shipping, whatever's in here. It feels like it's probably a computer and it's wrapped in a thin layer of bubble wrap with some plastic and stuff on here. And I guess we'll find out when we open it. So this package came from Florida and I can tell this came from Seth who sent in stuff to the channel before, but I'm pretty sure this was not sent by Seth specifically. Well, rather it was sent by Seth, but it was drop shipped. I think maybe an eBay listing or something like that. Seth's packing is normally impeccable <laughs> and um, well, like I said, this one, not so much. Let's see if we can open this thing up though. Oh, it's very wet on the inside as well. Well, that doesn't bode well that this is all sort of soaked, this paper. Hopefully the computer inside of this or whatever's in here is not also soaked as well. There is a layer of bubble wrap there, but this is the best corner. Although not really, I can feel the corner of the machine right there. I don't really think this thing will have survived unscathed. Yeah, this is all soaked, all this paper here. Hmm, yep, this cardboard up here is also all wet. Now this was delivered by FedEx. So I guess FedEx left this in the rain. There's no way the original shipper uh, would have exposed this to all this water, but uh, wow. All right, so this is the, um, the wet sock <laughs> that was around this. And it's, uh, it's sort of shredding, sending cardboard paper material everywhere in the basement here. I guess one positive is unlike normal, I'm actually getting to this a lot sooner. I usually let things sort of sit around and collect down the basement, but this thing, I think I picked up from the PO box pretty recently, just because it's really large. I wanted to open it and kind of get it out of this terrible packing material. And I'm glad I did that because the less time that it sits in this wet paper, the better. All right, so this is encased in bubble wrap, which maybe is a good thing. I think the biggest problem is, for instance, right here. This is just the metal of the computer, which of course just had that like thin layer of paper and cardboard and then plastic on the outside. So this was shipped FedEx across the country. Uh, yeah, like this. And I noticed there's a bunch of water in here too. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think what I'm going to do is get some gloves to open this up because I have a feeling it's just going to be pretty gross inside of here too. We're getting somewhere and um, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure actually, <laughs> I'm not sure this happened in shipping. This, this is rust right here. I, uh, I have a feeling this computer was potentially exposed to a ton of water and maybe it was actually just shipped with water inside and that actually leaked out into that cardboard because this looks kind of grim. Wow. Is this like black mold here? Hmm. So we're getting a glimpse here of this machine. Ah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words here. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what to think. <laughs> Let's just put this plastic back over a hill or here like this and try, I'll try to get the rest of the bubble wrap off. Here's the machine. It's still wrapped in plastic. It's definitely a lot of loose parts inside floating around. All right, well, we have a PC here. We obviously have a PC of some <laughs> of some type. I'm sorry, I'm just at a loss for words. Um, the condition of this is very, very rough. I'm, uh, I'm actually kind of shocked. Um, what's happening here? Wow. So I heard stuff floating around inside and obviously that's this uh, floppy drive here and looks like maybe there was a hard drive under here as well. That is a, uh, Kind of broken as well. Uh, the case actually, well, the front bezel 
uh, appears to be in okay shape. So what we have here is a Tandy 4000 personal computer. I don't even know what a Tandy 4000 is. Judging by, well, it's obviously a PC, right? This is, this is a regular PC, I guess, but we have a three and a half inch floppy drive that's extremely rusty. And there was a hard drive and then a, a floppy drive there. And I, judging by the look of this, I'm assuming this is like a 286 era machine, which is funny because the Tandy 1000, I know there was like 3000s, which were 36SXs, but they all looked like kind of small Tandy looking machines, kind of like the Tandy 1000 lineage and Tandy 4000, I don't know. Uh, looking at the side here, I'm keeping the plastic underneath here. Uh, that's definitely mold. <laughs> of some kind. And turning this around to look at the back, let me just cut this open here. There's definitely some Tandy lineage happening here. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is extreme. Uh, we have 10 slots, keyboard connector with stuff in it. Um, I'm assuming some kind of cable was attached there at, at some point. This is a VGA card. It has a 15 pin high density connector, a mouse, a bus mouse port there of some kind. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, you know what? Considering the packing, this thing actually survived shipping. It certainly didn't really survive what it had gone through before it got to me. I think uh, in a moment, I think we're gonna go outside and um, I'm gonna do the rest of this out there. Cause I don't, I don't really wanna open this up down here in the basement. I'm concerned about the debris getting everywhere. This side over here, we have the Tandy power switch, which that does look like a Tandy part. And um, yeah, so fascinating. I will tilt this up while we're here. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> a lot of mud just sort of fell down onto the plastic, which is I'm glad that plastic was still there and why I think I'm gonna take this out. Even though it's, I think it's raining outside, but I'd rather do this out there. I'll just use my phone to do the recording. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm at a little bit of a loss for words here about the condition of this. I'm just, I'm blown away. I'm blown away that whoever found this and, and put it online to sell sold a machine in this condition. And I'm, I'm wondering if they even showed the back or the bottom of this machine. I have a feeling they probably did it. They just showed the front. We're like, oh, look, it's a Tandy 4000, cool. And that was it. Because um, there's not much left of this machine. <laughs> it's really not much left. So this might just be an exploratory video. You know, maybe the motherboard is okay in there. We've seen worse, right? Field found 64s. This is definitely a field found. <laughs> computer though <laughs> judging by all the mud that just fell out of it yeah this is definitely definitely, definitely field found wow absolutely mind blowing <laughs> oh, okay okay i gotta compose myself here uh let me stop the recording and take this all outside all right, I'm gonna narrate as we take this thing apart. So as you can see, we're outside. Actually, the rain had stopped, so it's not gonna be getting wet inside. Taking the lid off this thing, it's insanely rough on the inside. I am pretty shocked at the whole thing. So first step is to get the drives out of this thing. The connections were really stuck, but take a look at the disk drive and the floppy disk that's inside. Yeah, that's, uh, that's never gonna work again. Now the drive itself is also in extremely poor condition. Flipping it over, the spindle motor, it doesn't turn at all. We'll take a closer look at this on the bench, but yeah, there's really no hope for that thing. There's a lithium battery here, or maybe an alkaline battery. It did not leak luckily, so that's kind of cool. Let's get some of these cards out. This one is the hard drive controller. It was already kind of half out of the slot. Looks pretty run of the mill, just an 8-bit card, which is kind of weird. Why is it 8-bit? I don't know. We have a stereo parallel card here. Next up, this is some kind of a bus mouse card from Logitech. And finally, we have a video card. Now, I couldn't actually get it out because there's some kind of a, well, residual part of a connector that's attached to the back of the card and it is super duper rusted on. So next up, let's take out this three and a half inch floppy drive. It had some screws on the sides with little rubber grommets and the drive did come out after a little bit of a fight because of the rust. 
And yeah, this might be an original drive, actually, now that I think about it. It does have a floppy drive inside, or a floppy disk inside, rather. It was very stuck and reluctant to come out, but I did get that out. Uh, it's an actual Tandy disk, so there's really no chance that uh, that disk is going to work. Now, there is a Seagate hard drive there, as you can see, an ST251. And this drive is actually in the worst condition of any Seagate hard drive I've ever seen. Now, there is no chance this thing is going to work. They were very unreliable at the best of times, so I think there's no chance here. But you can really get an idea of how bad the condition is of the case. The whole bottom is just in such poor condition. There's the badge, though, in case you're wondering. Tandy 4000 and the serial number as well. I'm assuming um, this was 6,000-something um, machine. This red thing on the front appears to be a reset button. It has a lever action going on, so when you push that white part that sticks through the front of the case, it pushes a uh, reset button on the motherboard. Next up, let's try to get the power supply out. There were a couple screws and wasn't really budging, so I'm taking off the fan grill here. I wasn't sure if that was actually attached to the power supply or not. Underneath the computer, there was at least one screw that I could take out. Looking for other ones, um, I don't really see any others. Well, it turned out that there's actually another screw on the back of the case in the rust zone there, and I couldn't get it off. So it's time for the angle grinder. So I'm wearing my safety goggles and ear protection, and all I can do is just grind the whole head off that screw because it's completely gone, but also that power supply is stuck in there. So I was able to get it off, and here it is, <laughs> power supply. <laughs> you got a little glimpse there. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, plant life in there. <laughs> so just kind of shows how this thing obviously was not just in a wet environment for a long time, but outside, I'm presuming, because of all the plant debris in here. So next up is the video card. I want to get this out of here so we can get the motherboard out. So angle grinder to the rescue again. I got to get the little screws off that whatever little piece of shrapnel that's plugged into the board. But after that, I was able to get it out. And the card came out. And yeah, it's a Video 7 EGA VGA card, also 8-bit, which is weird. That's just leaving terrible amount of performance on the table because this is a faster 16-bit system. So what's the deal with that? Well, it's a 32-bit system, of course, but the ISA bus is only 16-bit. So removing the motherboard, there is just a bunch of screws all around. And on the far right edge, close to the drives and power supply, there's sort of like these little angled slot things. And lifting the motherboard out just sort of pops out. It's not in horrible condition, but it's also, it's, it's pretty poor as well. There's a lot of corrosion on the edges, especially the edge over by the drives and the power supply. And now you can see the rest of the computer. It's uh, pretty much the worst condition PC I think I've ever seen. Before we take a look at the parts that I took out of that rusty case, let's take a look at this Tandy catalog I found from 1988, which talks about the Tandy 4000, because to be honest, really knew pretty much nothing about this machine. So it'd be kind of cool to read up about it a little bit. Ah, the 1988 Tandy catalog. Looks like we have the Tandy 4000 right here on the cover as well. So that's what the machine is supposed to look like when it's not all, well, field found. There we can get a look at the, well, relatively mundane looking AT keyboard as well. Scrolling down a little bit, it reveals the machine. 8386 power is here, the Tandy 4000. Wow. Now, right off the bat, this monitor that's sitting on top of the computer is one that I don't really recognize. And I wonder if it's a VGA or EGA monitor that perhaps Radio Shack sold at this point. Here's the machine again. Unfortunately, the scan is a little uh, potato looking, but we can see here that the original three and a half inch disk drive, I don't think this was the one that was in the machine actually, because this has a center eject button. And the one that was in the computer, I'm pretty sure the eject button was off to the side. Unless, of course, that button that's on the front bezel there just sort of pushes off to the side. So the Tandy 4000 with 1.4 megabyte floppy drive, a price breakthrough in 8386 technology. And it does say new for 1988. Now, I did glimpse the motherboard. You might have noticed it when I was taking it apart. It says 1987 on the motherboard. And in fact, a lot of the date codes that are on the chips are also from 1987. So my assumption is that this machine wasn't actually released until the beginning of 1988. And perhaps this poor machine that was obviously left out to die <laughs> was built in 1987 for that early initial release. I suppose the other thing we can consider is that they built a bunch of machines ahead of time thinking this would be like a hot seller and no one actually bought the machine. So even in 1988, like all the machines sold throughout the year were probably all manufactured in 1987. <laughs> because if you just Google around for Tandy 4000, 
you're not really going to find much information about it. In fact, this video where I am going to show the parts and stuff that we took out of the machine may be the most in-depth video with the most like shots of the actual motherboard and stuff that maybe exists out there. Let me know if you know of any other Tandy 4000 videos, but I did a quick search and I didn't really find anything except for some stuff that was really old, like nine, 10 year old videos that were just sort of a quick overview without getting into technical details. Anyhow, we can see here that this machine is 16 megahertz. It's a 36DX, right? The SX, I don't think it was even out yet in 88. 32 bit data path to the RAM. So you're getting all the benefits of a uh, you know, 386 processor does have a high density disk drive, which I think was the first on any of the Tandy machines. I have a Tandy 1000 TL, I think it is, which is a 286 based machine. And while most 286s have high density disk drives, pretty sure the TL is actually like an XT class machine. I mean, it has eight bit slots in it. I don't even know if it has 16 bit memory, but it has a 286 processor for like the improvement in speed. I think it does have 16 bit memory, but the rest of the IO on there is purely XT. It doesn't have the extra IRQs, the extra DMA channels, none of the enhancements that IBM brought to the AT series. This machine on the other hand is a complete, just full on 386. And we can see that their angle here was that this 4000 is so cost effective that you're gonna pay less for this machine at $2,600 than a competitor's 286 machine. Now they're not quoting who they're talking about exactly. And I'm pretty sure that there were clone 386s by 1988. And I have a hard time believing that it was actually cheaper to go to a Radio Shack store to get one. But maybe they're talking about like an IBM PS2 with a 386. Those were probably very expensive machines. And I don't really know how much the Compact Desk Pro with a 386 was. I think the Desk Pro was actually the first machine to ever have a 386. That's just off the top of my head, at least. They're using terms like blinding 16 megahertz clock speed. I mean, I guess compared to 4.77 megahertz and the fact that you have a 32-bit bus versus an 8-bit bus, you are getting a dramatic speed increase. It says here that the Norton, probably SysInfo tool, uh, which does a performance test, gives a rating of 17 for this machine, while the original XT gives you a 1.0. So in that benchmark, at least, it's 17 times faster, which is pretty amazing, actually. I mean, I just, I just wanna reiterate the pace of progress back then. The original PC came out in 1981. Now, it was using a processor that came out in the 70s. But nonetheless, like the first PC was in 1981. And then by just seven years later, you had a computer that was 17 times faster. Think about what we're dealing with now. If you look at the single core performance of a computer from seven years ago versus like the modern day Intel and AMD processors, it's just like, there's barely an increase. I mean, yes, it's faster. I don't even know if it's two times faster. I don't think so. Maybe it's two times faster if you look back 10 years on single core performance. And the only real performance improvements we're getting here is like they keep raising the clock speed, which is one thing, and then they keep adding cores. But the problem is a lot of software, even today that we use, is not really set up for multi-core processors. So going from like a 10-year-old processor to a today processor is not gonna make your web browsing like 10 times faster <laughs> or anything like that. It's gonna be like a, a slight, if noticeable difference in performance. So anyways, point being, Back then, like the difference between an XT and this, you would notice the difference. It really is a dramatic performance improvement. So the marketing terms they're using here, I mean, it's a bit silly, blazing fast and stuff like that. But I mean, the reality is it's, it's a big difference. It's a huge improvement. Oh, okay, wait a second. I just see the next sentence here. In fact, the 4000 is so far ahead in what you'd expect in personal computers, perhaps it's best to describe its performance in mainframe terminology. I mean, that's just ridiculous. They go on to talk a little bit about the enhanced 36 modes, like protected and native modes that give you like the full 32 bit power of this. And looks like OS2 was like the big deal that was coming down the pipe. And yes, it was. There was a lot of hoopla about how OS2 was going to transform PCs from like this DOS limited thing to something that was really powerful and capable. Well, we all know. <laughs> how that worked out. OS2, of course, was a collaboration between IBM and Microsoft. And while well, Microsoft kind of like pulled the plug and was like, nah, you're on your own, just kidding. And went off to do Windows NT on their own. And of course, uh, you know, I'm using a Windows 10 computer here. Windows 11 is what's current on PCs. And uh, well, it's all based on Windows NT technology, right? That goes back to the early versions of Windows NT, which of course, OS2, 
I don't even think there's any NT technology in OS2. I don't even know all the details there, but I do know that OS2 was pretty cool. And there was, I think, what, like four versions of it all the way through that OS2 warp, which I think was version four, but it was the hotness in the late eighties. And everyone was like, yes, OS2 is coming and we're gonna have powerful computers with multitasking finally, you know, while these Unix machines and more powerful things could actually do that stuff. Like DOS was leaving people with this, you know, pseudo desk view, kind of like multitasking or Microsoft Windows, like, you know, not really, right? Those old versions. So yeah, it's so funny they mentioned OS2 and what a fail that was. It does say one meg of RAM is standard, but you can expand with another one meg to two megs, or you can bring this total system memory to four megabytes. It also mentions that you can use one megabit chips to allow up to 16 megs. So you may have noticed when I had the motherboard coming out of the computer, there were eight RAM slots on there and it looks like they had two 56K SIMs on there. So one meg was installed. So it's talking about one or two megs using those eight slots. I did see a photo, it might be in this here if we keep going, uh, of a RAM board that plugs into an extra slot on there that has like 32 bit RAM expansion. So it looks like if you use one meg SIMs, you can go all the way up to 16 megabytes, which um, no, that's not bad for something that's just on board. Now the address space of the 3D6 is far beyond uh, 16 megs. In fact, the 2D6 could address up to 16 megabytes natively, had enough address lines for that. So it's not really giving you like the full capability of 3D6 here, but nonetheless, you know, at that time, RAM was still very expensive in the 80s. And it's not like people were running out and putting, you know, 128 megs of RAM in their computer and stuff like that. Not at that time, at least. Anyhow, that's a really a spiel on this machine for their marketing speak here. But looking at the prices, Tandy 4000, one megabyte of RAM, that's no hard drive, $2,599. The same machine with that three and a half inch drive and a hard drive, $3,500. And it goes up to 4,300 if you add a 40 meg hard drive. Now, what's pretty cool, if you take a look down here at the specifications, the operating system came with MS-DOS 3.2. So it just kind of tells you how early this was. Now, MS-DOS 3.3 was really the common version that you usually found, but Tandy had a customized version, which was 3.2. I'm pretty sure that was the Tandy version, which is what they were doing on here. But look at this, they're also promoting the fact you can run Xenix. So that's a Unix, System 5 Unix, that is designed for the PC. And I'm pretty sure there's a Xenix version that they sold with the TRS-80 Model 2. So that's the Z80-based machine. And well, the later versions, which I think it was called the TRS-80 or the Tandy 6000, I'm kind of drawing a blank on all the weird models they had, but there was like the TRS-80 Model 16, I think it was, had a Motorola 68000 processor and the Z80 processor, so it could run older software. And then you could run 68000 based software and Xenix was ported as well to that. So now looking at WinWorld here, Xenix is a variant of Unix published by Microsoft. Oh, that's right. Xenix is a Microsoft product. It was later sold to SCO, so SCO Unix, which is pretty popular like throughout the years on the PC architecture, ended up, uh, well, it was used on a lot of servers and stuff in the back end. You never really had it as like a desktop OS. It was ported to many different platforms. And there it is. There's the TRC Model 16 I was talking about, which is the successor to the Model 2 and it has the 68,000 card in there. Looks like a version existed for the Apple Lisa. I was completely unaware of that. I clicked on the 3D6 release here and I love here, it says that, <laughs> please be aware that the early versions are extremely buggy and were very picky about the hardware they were running on. And it was funny, at this point, it looks like they were actually branding it SCO Xenix, so they got away from the Microsoft branding even by the time of this 2.x release. Anyhow, sorry for the tangent on the Xenix, but yeah, it's just interesting how they are literally mentioning the fact that you could run Unix on your Tandy 4000. That's kind of cool. Ah, and look right here on the next page. If I had just scrolled down, Tandy Workgroup Solution. Oh yeah, using Xenix. Turns your Tandy 4000 into a multi-user system that can support up to five workstations, including the C-shell programming environment, menu-driven help system, and support for Tandy hardware peripherals, such as tape and cartridge backup. $600 for the OS. That's another reason why Linux just sort of like, whoa, kicked to go to the curb. Who's paying $600 for Unix when you could get an open source version for free that was continually developed and getting better and better and better. And you know, you had the source code too, so you could compile and bug fix and do whatever you wanted to versus this, which yeah, <laughs> anyhow. Looks like there's some additional software you could buy, some development systems, so you have to pay another $600 for your like C compiler or whatever. 
<laughs> and, and remember, this is like old money, $600 in the 80s is a lot more now. And down here is talking about MS-DOS and BASIC and DeskMate. Uh, did that mean that the Tandy 4000 did not include MS-DOS? That's unusual. I thought the Tandy 1000s all did, but maybe, maybe it didn't. And then down here, there's the DT100. So they did sell a line of data terminals and the original ones were like, they look like TRS-80 Model 3s or Model 4s actually with the white case, but the guts were swapped out. So it just had a terminal inside RS-232, but it really was big. It looked like an all-in-one kind of um, TRS-80. This, on the other hand, that really just looks like, I think, a Weiss terminal, especially looking at that keyboard. Obviously, I mean, it doesn't even have any branding on the front that's visible, but they're calling it the DT100, and it's uh, DEC VT100 and Unix-based software compatible. Okay, 700 extra dollars, which, you know, I don't know if that was a good price in 1988, but I can tell you that in 1988, you could say pick up a Laser 128 for a whopping 399 and boot a piece of software on it, hook it up to a modem or whatever, and it would act as a terminal as well. You just have to hook up a monochrome monitor to it, which, you know, you get for a hundred extra bucks or whatever, and you'd have an entire computer that you could do stuff on. So taking a look over here, we have the various uh, expansion options, including, like I mentioned, the RAM expansion board that not was not in this computer. This plugs into that 32-bit slot there and gives you zero weight, say, access to the RAM at full 16 megabytes. Now, scrolling down the rest of this, it looks like there's another model that I was also unaware of, the Tandy 3000, which looks to be identical case and keyboard as the 4000, but with a 286 in there. I'm assuming it's a 286. It also has five and a quarter inch disk drive as standard as opposed to three and a half and fast 12 megahertz clock speed with 640K of RAM expandable up to 16 megabytes. The price of the 286 machine was $19.99. And you know, to be honest, uh, this one here was $2,600. Not bad, $600 extra dollars for a 3D6. I think the performance improvement would be pretty substantial, not to mention you got access to all that 3D6 protected mode stuff and extra features with the 3D6 system. And scrolling down a little further, it looks like we have an affordable option, which I bet you is a model that has a two, eight megahertz processor in it. And it's the Tandy 3000 HL, all stuff I've never really heard of. Oh, it's got 512K instead of 640K. And yes, eight megahertz bus as well. Forgot to mention, I think I talked about this when it said MS-DOS and it was listing a price. Looks like the operating system was not included with these machines. It was optional, which is kind of stingy on their part that right away they wanted you to spend an extra $100 to get MS-DOS plus Deskmate 2. When I'm quite sure with the Tandy 1000s, that was included. Actually, I'm sure that's going to be further down in this thing, so we'll see that. But that does seem slightly stingy on Radio Shack's part. Nonetheless, Tandy 3000 HL, 3000, and 4000, all machines, to be honest, I have never seen in person and never heard of. And I used to go to Radio Shacks all the time, and I have a whole bunch of Tandy 1000s and other TRS-80 Radio Shack computer, Tandy Radio Shack computers like Coco's and Model 123 and all that stuff. And yet <laughs> there are these machines. They must not have sold many of these. They must have really flopped in the market because uh, like I said, oh yeah, okay. So now we're moving on to the Tandy 1000s and these sold like hotcakes. And I think the reason why, well, I think they were just a lot cheaper. So $1,199 for an eight megahertz 286. And you see this one here is $1,500. And you know, the 12 megahertz, yeah, it's a little bit faster, but it's, it's, it's almost twice as expensive right there. And on top of that, I, as far as I'm aware, these were just like normal CGA, EGA, VGA type graphics, didn't give you any of the benefits of the Tandy 1000 line, which were three voice sound, 16 color, 320 by 240 graphics, or 320 by 200 graphics that came from the original PC Junior. And you know, these machines were very, very popular. And I'm pretty sure that this one, it says it's six times faster than NXT. Interesting. I am quite sure that the Tandy 1000, what is this? It's a TX. While it has a 286, I'm pretty sure this is just like my TL, which has a slightly like more modern looking case, is also an 8-bit system. So it's an XT with a 286 grafted onto it. And, and yeah, just like I thought, they bundled MS-DOS, DeskMate, and BASIC with these systems. So it made it even cheaper because those other ones you have to pay extra as well. So yeah, I wonder what they what they had in mind there with that. Why were they being so stingy? They wanted you to buy the extra OS. I suppose they were just thinking that you would maybe go right to OS2 or right to Xenix and you wouldn't even use MS-DOS. So that gave you the 
option of doing it that way. But yeah, check it out right here. CGA compatible with 640 by 200 at four colors, which is better than CGA, which is one color. And 320 by 200 at 16 colors. So that's better than the four color mode of, uh, of regular CGA. So yeah, it's really, really improved. Does it say anything on these other Tandys? Like this is a 3000 here. It says video display, optional, high resolution, non-glare, non-interlaced, 12 inch monochrome green or 14 inch color monitor. Doesn't even talk about the graphics capabilities at all, which is interesting because take a look at this. I think this is Microsoft Windows to be honest and it looks like it's running in EGA. That's certainly more colors than you get in CGA, but they don't even talk about like what capabilities this thing has unless I've missed it. And we keep going here and here's the Tandy 1000 HX, which is a great machine. I have one of these things. And look at that, $700. It's funny, actually, this is actually what I was saying. This is only slightly more by a few dollars than that terminal that was up on the higher page. And yeah, that doesn't come with a monitor, right? That's extra and a monitor platform, oh, 30 bucks. And they were still selling the older EX model here for $599. The HX was a nice improvement because I had three and a half inch floppy drive and it had stuff in ROM. But otherwise, they're very, very similar, to be honest. Aha, here are the monitors. Okay. I'm quite sure that the Tandy 3000 and 4000 did not come with a bundled video card. So you didn't even have a way to use the computer when you bought it. And you had to buy an extra video card. That makes the price even more ridiculous. So it looks like they had a couple different video adapters. One of them was interesting. It could offer 640 by 200 in 16 colors, but it says with special software. I have a feeling that's some kind of like Plantronics card maybe, because it says it's uh, IBM CGA and MDA compatible. Well, what exactly is producing 640 by 216 colors? EGA could do that, but that's not an EGA card because right here, EGA card is the next one down at 300 extra dollars. That can do 640 by 350 in 16 colors and also a 200 lines in 16 colors. But this one here, if anyone's familiar with this uh, cat number 253045, what kind of card was this? Yeah, like I said, I think this is like a Plantronics card maybe or something, or perhaps some kind of Hercules card that has the capability of doing CGA, MDA, and then some 640 by 216 colors. But the worst thing is, is that that card is not gonna be compatible with the Tandy 1000 graphics mode or the PC Junior. So none of the games and software that would work on that would work on this computer in anything better than CGA. So like, yeah, these machines were, I think, a big letdown because they broke all the compatibility with the Handy 1000 line, which was immensely successful. And I think these things are little more than just commodity PCs. And then for the monitors, we have a few different choices. So this one here is the CM11, right? So this is the high resolution version of the Tandy 1000 monitor. There's also the CM5, which looks exactly like that, except the bezel here is white and it's a much lower resolution. And then number B here, which is the monitor we saw on top of the Tandy 4000 is actually this monitor, which is full EGA and it's $700. Costs more than the Tandy 1000 or the same as the Tandy 1000 HX, which is the better version with the, the floppy drives and stuff. So of course with the HX, you would still need to combine that with one of these monitors, one of these ones over here. So 299 extra dollars. You could buy a third party one. You could also hook it up through composite video because if you're just displaying monochrome text. Anyways, okay, well, I think I've probably looked through enough stuff here. We have a mouse. Wow, well, a Logitech mouse. <laughs> like, oh, that horrible looking Logitech mouse for a hundred extra bucks. Looks like uh, they had an Apple Watch back then, uh, the smartwatch, <laughs> perpetual clock calendar. Oh no, that's a chip that goes in the computer. So you didn't need it on the 3000 or 4000, but on the 1000s, I think it plugged into the ROM socket underneath the ROM chip. And then it allowed you to store a uh, clock and stuff because there was nothing there. This drive right here for $1,800, that's a, a Bernoulli drive. So like the precursor to the SyQuest drives. In fact, iOmega ended up buying this company here, and I do have some of these Brunoli drives around the house. I think uh, capacity-wise, were they 45 megabytes also and 90? So I guess 20 was the first then. But what these disks are is it's just a hard drive platter inside a hard shell, and you stick it in there and it spins up and whatever. Oh yeah, look, it even says Brunoli technology right here. So it's a hard drive platter and a cartridge, and an extra one is $1,000. So I don't quite understand what the secondary 20 megabyte DCS is, but I assume it's just 
two, and maybe the cost difference is a SCSI controller. I'm pretty sure these all use SCSI. In fact, yeah, you look right here, that's a SCSI connector. Are they really charging 800 extra dollars for a SCSI controller? That seems excessive. But when you do shell out the money, you can then buy extra 20 meg cartridges for $100. Compare that right here to 20 megabyte hard drives at $600. So yeah, the expandability was there, just a very, very steep purchase price. There are laser printers and discs and covers and desks and just so much stuff. Wow. So yeah, this is really cool. I'll put a link to this right here. It's this uh, colorcomputerarchive.com. This is just pretty awesome to look through. It's just sort of nostalgic, but it's just pretty cool that the Tandy 3000 and 4000 was there. In my quick research that I did on the Tandy 4000, it seems that there was a later version. There might've been a 5000 as well. And I think there was a version of the 4000 with 20 megahertz, so not just 16 but I don't know how much longer they were selling this because eventually the Tandy 1000 line was converted into the Sensation line or something. I think AST bought the whole computer line from Radio Shack in the early, early 90s and then was selling computers that were like rebadged AST machines as Radio Shack machines. And these were like 3D6s and 4D6s that just was the same commodity computer stuff you would get like with any other brand. So any Radio Shack specialness was gone. Although there doesn't really appear to be very much of it left even in these machines because they just appear to be quite commodity. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. So, all right, so enough talking. Let me go grab that stuff and we'll take a closer look at it. And I guess we can try to power it up. This video is probably gonna be really long. <laughs> All right, so I have all the parts from the Tandy 4000 right here, everything I took out of it. Now, the case and the power supply are both outside in the garage. They're just way too dirty to bring back in the house. And you might be wondering on this motherboard here, which is sitting on the top, what are these wires here? Well, I cut the connector off the power supply because the motherboard uses a proprietary power connector that's different than most other cases. And I would like to at least try to power this motherboard up. This motherboard's in pretty rough shape, so it may not work, but I did a quick Google search and the schematics are available for this motherboard. Tandy has a hardware reference manual for the 4000. Maybe at some point in the future, I can attempt to see if I can get this thing running. Although I have to be kind of honest that looking at this board here, we'll just take a look at it you know, closer in a second. It's just a commodity 3D6 board. There's absolutely nothing Tandy specific on this board whatsoever. So it's not that different than any other 3D6 PC motherboard other than the form factor being a little bit different than a standard AT form factor. Okay, the first item we're gonna take a look at is this Seagate ST251. This thing has seen better days. Has anyone ever seen a corroded hard drive or one as bad as this? Now, unfortunately with these Seagate drives, they're not sealed. It's open right there. There's a little air filter on the other side of that hole there. So any moisture and water this computer was exposed to would have just gone inside of this poor hard drive. Bottom side there, there's the stepper motor and uh, that's the spindle termination resistor. Let's take these cables off here. Oh, the, bolt, the gold contacts are in decent shape at least. So why don't we just pop the cover off this thing and what I'll do is I'll grab a power supply. We will try to power it up. I mean, I don't expect it to do anything, but we're gonna look inside first because perhaps uh, the drive is stuck and we can just spin it with our hands. And then after that, maybe it'll spin on its own. All right, so it looks like these are Torx bits here, I think. Oh, wow, that is so stuck. Okay, there we go, I got it to move. So even though this thing is made out of aluminum and aluminum doesn't really rust per se, as you can see, this is a heavy, heavy amount of corrosion on there. And the screws have corroded into their sockets as well. Oh, this one here looks really rusty. I don't think this one's gonna come out, everyone. Oh, no, that's gonna break. I think it's gonna break my bit, to be honest. Let's try this one here. Okay, that one worked. It turned a little bit and then it got really, really difficult. Let's switch to this flat blade here. Might have a little bit more torque. Yeah, yeah, I can put more torque onto that. For removing fasteners that are corroded, I've seen on some of the car channels for people who live in places where there's a lot of rust, that you can apply some heat and maybe, just maybe, that'll somehow help. So this is a little blowtorch here. There's no way this is gonna do anything. But you never know, I don't know. I don't know, it's possible, right? All right, let's see if that did anything at all. It's probably not nearly enough heat. Probably need to use like a map gas torch of some kind. Okay, that's in there. 
Oh boy, nope, it's about to break. I think, yeah. I didn't break my bit luckily, but the head is just completely stripped out. So I'm just gonna pry this open and we're gonna use brute force. There is no chance this drive's ever gonna work again, so. Okay, there we go. A little brute force. Um, it actually didn't break the top cover, it just broke the screw, that was the fastener that was holding that on. So that's inside. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, you don't want to see this. This, this right here? No, that's, um, that's not good in your hard drive. It, it's really, it's really not. Um, um, <laughs> I mean, it's actually in better condition, I suppose, than I originally thought. Uh, let's look at the top cover here. Where did all that sand come from? Well, it didn't come from this top cover. Uh, I don't really know. Um, maybe, oh wow. So this doesn't even turn at all. And the, and the wild thing is, of course, I'm able to exert pressure. Wow, I can feel the heat that I put into that fastener there. Um, it's not stuck on the heads because, you know, it's turning this much without any issue here. But I'm, okay, if I force it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. You can see the head there isn't even connected any longer. So, uh, yeah. Seagate hard drives. They're durable. I mean, they can be. I said they were not earlier, but this one will never ever work again. <laughs> so this hard drive is gonna have to go to e-waste. As far as the stepper actuator here for moving the heads, that doesn't move. That doesn't move at all. No, this, this motor here is completely seized. That is completely stuck. So this is what happens to your hard drive when you leave it outside in um, a field or a backyard or wherever this computer was, it ends up looking like, like this. Total garbage, unfortunately. We'll just put that, we'll just put that lid back on. It's like as if nothing ever happened. Yeah, it's, it's, this is, we just, this, this will work perfectly. This right here is the little front cover that was on the hard drive. It was attached at some point, but it was, it was snapped off. The outside looks okay, but the inside really belies all the corrosion that was on this thing. So speaking of disk media, let's take a look at the floppy drive. And I, I'm, everything I touch is getting this white corrosion powder on everything. So it's all over my camera now. Here is the, uh, okay, well, here's the battery. We can see if this was what? Alkaline? Just says backup battery. I think these are generally, these are generally alkaline batteries. Interesting is that the connection there, typically it's four pins, but it's on the outside. And um, you can see there, it's using uh, a three pin connector with the ground in the middle. Looking at this floppy drive here, I talked about this in the voiceover. I mean, what is there to say? There's just an extra screw on there and some plant material. The corrosion on here is, it's pretty extreme. Um, oh, I guess those are just some screws that were inside the computer. I just threw them on top of the drive, I guess. So this drive is a Toshiba drive, right? It says Toshiba here on the spindle motor. There is the label, an FDD 6882EIJ. Yes, Toshiba Corporation made in Japan. So looking at the bottom here, the spindle motor is supposed to be able to turn. And I can force it. <laughs> the stepper motor for moving the heads, very frozen looking. Let's grab a screwdriver. We'll try to turn that. Okay, I'm, I'm on the shaft. Oh no, that is 100% oh, frozen. And I'm just screwing up this shaft there. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you see it's kind of wallowing that out a little bit. That's never gonna work again. Mechanical devices, they do not appreciate to be inundated with water for long periods of time. And this floppy disk here, which has an unreadable label, it just says diskette number on there. Does it turn? Nope. Oh, there we go. 
all that sand in there is really good for the, the magnetic surface, you know. Um, makes it really reliable in the future when you try to read it when all that dirt is, is caught up in here. So as you spin the disc around, it just scratches it all. Uh, there's the part that was exposed. <laughs> uh, I'm not putting this in any of my floppy drives. No, unfortunately, um, that would be a recipe for disaster. Okay, next up, um, that's the fan grill. Here's a three and a half inch floppy drive. Now we can see quite clearly that this is a Tandy part number here, Tandy Corporation 1987. A little bodge going on right there. I didn't even notice that this has two connectors on it. So you could just have a cable that went from the motherboard to here and then a pass through. Now Tandy was notorious for not using the twist and you had to set the each drive appropriately like DS0 for drive A, DS1 for drive B. So kind of non-standard. So I don't really know if this drive is following that convention or not with this, uh, this interesting dual connector thing. And you could see the rust and the corrosion that we have here. And then looking here at the front, I was saying in the voiceover that I wasn't sure if this had a center eject button. It does though, because it actually has, you can see here, actually has a, a lever that can attach on both sides. So that large center button would attach on both sides and then you would push it in. I don't recognize the brand of this drive. What we can do is try to get it out of this, maybe. All right, those screws have been removed. So let's pop this out. Ah, it's a Sony drive. There it is, MP-F73W. We definitely have a, an absolute ton of corrosion, but look at this, that actually spins. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> dirt can get inside there. This is, uh, I've had drives before where dirt's gotten inside there and made horrible noise when you spin this, but this one actually spins. The bearing sounds bad. You won't be able to hear it on the video, but it doesn't feel smooth but at least it's not all, all crunchy. Similar construction to the Apple Macintosh floppy drives, to be honest, the board on the bottom doesn't look that different, but it goes without saying that there's very little chance that this drive works in any way. So let's just pop it open though. Let's see if this looks just like the Mac drives on the inside. It does indeed. If you've worked on an Apple Macintosh drive, you know that the eject mechanism sits right here um, it doesn't look exactly the same, but it's not that different either. Now this disc was inside there. It's a uh, Tandy, it says utilities on there. But lucky for us, PC disk drives are pretty common. They're made millions and millions and millions of them. And you can see here that the connector is just the standard 34 pin connector and a regular Berg power connector. So there is nothing specifically unique about this floppy drive other than it's a Sony drive. And um, I don't generally see Sony drives that look like this, at least on PCs. All right, next thing to look at is this, the Video 7 8-bit VGA slash EGA card. So this is obviously what was stuck on here. And I had to use the angle grinder to try to get it off. Looks like there was probably a monitor attached at some point and it probably got yanked off and smashed or whatever. Looking at this card though, it is not in horrible condition. It actually looks okay. Corrosion inside these chips here are gonna be a particular issue, but not too bad. Cirrus Logic chipset, these types of combo cards could output EGA or VGA or CGA. They supported basically everything, usually MDA as well. You just set it up with these dip switches here. There's a possibility this card works. So we'll have to definitely test that. The only thing really, I gotta get the residual of this connector off of here. Oh, there we go. It's rusty there, but it may well work. It doesn't look too bad actually. And as for the rest of the cards that were in here, this is that Logitech bus mouse card. So pretty run of the mill, standard bus mouse connector there, plus a whole lot of corrosion. I am not familiar with these bus mice cards, but there it is. Here is the serial parallel card. It's got a nine pin serial port, 25 pin parallel port. It doesn't have any provisions for a second serial port. We have a 16450 UR here though. So this is the more fancy one that has built in buffer. So this is actually a, a pretty good card actually. I mean, well, for the time. It does say 1985 on it though. So I'm assuming that this was sold for the Tandy 1000 line as well. And it was just used in uh, this computer too. And then this was the last card that was in there. This is the Conan or Conan hard drive controller. So an MFM hard drive controller of some type. 
There's a Conan BIOS chip there, KXP230ZA. Don't know if that's the actual part number of this card or not. Interesting is we have a Conan branded Logic IC built by National Semiconductors, kind of cool. And there's actually KXP230 right there as the model number. And then this ROM chip here says PHX110D. And right here it says, made in USA. I'm not 100% sure if Radio Shack was selling this with their hard drive kits or this was something that was aftermarket. Don't really know. And I think before I take a look at the motherboard, I am going to clean this mess up because this is horrible. I don't want to get all this onto the motherboard, which I did hose off outside with the garden hose so that I could clean off some of the dirt and stuff that was on it. All right, everything is cleaned up. There's the motherboard. First, I need to try to get this uh, floppy drive cable off. And I just noticed it doesn't even need the pass through. It's got the twist. So this just uses standard IBM PC thing. I, my assumption is that adapter maybe was for use on other Tandy computers and you plug this one into that specific port. So earlier I didn't get this off because there's a ton of corrosion on the board right here and I actually couldn't get this off. So for now, we're just gonna cut this because uh, I could try to deal with this later. Starting with what we see over here in the bottom corner, this is the 32-bit RAM slot that allows you to expand the memory. I don't remember where I saw a photograph, but it looked like a card that was maybe about this big and it had additional SIM slots on it. I think eight more for a total of 16 megabytes if you use one megabyte SIMs in all the memory slots here. Two 8-bit slots and we have six other 16-bit slots. Question goes back to what I was saying earlier. Why were all the cards that were installed in here just 8-bit cards? Lots of performance is being left on the table for the hard drive, for the video card, by just using 8-bit cards. Don't really understand that. Here in this corner of the motherboard, we have the keyboard connector. We have probably the keyboard controller. And unfortunately, it's extremely corroded. So I don't know if this is a standard part that we can replace with something else. Who knows if that's going to work or not? I mean, there's lots of sockets on this motherboard. So almost certainly we're going to have a bunch of issues with that. Chips and technology, standard 3D6 chipset. So that's probably a run of the mill. That's uh, the same on any other AT 3D6 motherboard of the time. There's that strange power connector I was talking about. There's the floppy drive connector. And if I move this over a little bit, we have right there the floppy drive controller itself. So that is integrated onto the motherboard. It's the one thing that they integrated into the motherboard that didn't make you buy extra. Thank you, Tandy. That was so nice of you just to include just a floppy drive controller with this computer. What has me a little bit worried again is that there are numerous PAL chips, programmable array logic chips. We have two there. There's another one over here and we have another one over here. So with those four chips, those are pretty custom. And if any of those are damaged, there's no way this thing is ever gonna work. I don't know if Tandy published the equations for these in the service manual for the 4000. Maybe they did. I just quickly perused it. It is available luckily, so that's something. But without those equations, there's pretty much no chance this thing's ever gonna work. These will probably have to do with the select logic for the floppy drive controller itself. So maybe with those removed, things would still work, but it's hard to know because we have a couple crystal oscillators right here. Those could be for providing clocks to the motherboard and those PALs might be uh, for that as well. So that's the power connector I was talking about, which is why I cut this off so we can actually attempt to power this thing up. I will have to make some guesses on the colors here and like what they all mean, but a regular power supply is gonna have five volts, which is red. Purple on this one is 12 volts. Then there's a minus five, minus 12, which is probably these two wires. And then this wire right here that has the stripe on it might be the power good signal. So that's a five volt signal that goes into the motherboard to let the chipset know that the power supply is ready for the computer to boot. And usually what happens is the computer will sit there and hold reset until you provide power good, five volts on power good. And then it will release the reset signal and then begin execution of code. We have right here the 386DX 16 megahertz. So that's the star of the show on this computer. We have what looks like the math code processor socket. And what's interesting is it said in the catalog we were looking at that this thing uses an 8287 math code processor, which is certainly what goes in this slot right here, 40 pin dip. So it's funny that this thing supported both, but I think in 1988, and people will have to correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the 3D7 was not available yet at the time of when this machine was released. Moving on, we have two BIOS chips here. So 16-bit, the stickers are gone from these. It looks like there was a sticker at some point, so we don't know what version it is, but I can definitely try to dump these. If they come out of the sockets, they're extremely corroded. And pulling these out may just break the legs off and, well, we'll see what happens. 
Uh, TTL logic here. These are some resistor packs or pull-up resistors and things. And then we have our eight SIM slots. Now they are all plastic sockets, just like on the older Macintoshes. Let's zoom in a little bit here. This is one megabyte right here. And we have a second bank for up to two megabytes or eight megabytes when you use the extra RAM. We have a speaker connection right there. And this one says LED. So probably the power LED. We have a reset button right here on the front. And what is interesting is there is an extra switch right here. And the label on the motherboard says keyboard inhibit. Now there was a key lock switch on the front of the case. And I have a feeling that it must push on this lever here. There was like a little metal bar contraption and that is the keyboard lock. But let's take a look at some of these part numbers here. We have an 82C206, that's for that chipset there. And we have an 82C302. So all of these different things will work together to create the chipset required for the 386. And this one here is an 82C301. And the rest of them, unfortunately, I can't read. I can see this one does say chips on there, but the writing is, is completely missing. And here's our 8386 at 16 megahertz. Let's make it so you can actually read that. I don't see a date code on there, but I'm assuming it's 1987, like everything else is on this motherboard. Now, this is what I was talking about with the corrosion. There's an absolute ton of it along this edge right here. And I think that's because the drive cage was up against the motherboard right there. And it has just done a number on this whole section of the board. So right there alone might be, well, enough to kill this machine and prevent it from ever working. Let's see if I can budge this floppy connector. Ah, okay, it's moving. Cool. Oh, it's crunchy, everyone. Anyhow, it gives you an idea again of the corrosion that we're talking about here. And all oh, these PALs are just, they're a disaster. Not sure what this connector went to. Oh, that was the battery connection right there. So maybe one of these is the real-time clock. Oh, no, that's, I can see this here as a PAL under there. I think the battery connection here makes its way over to this side of the board because there's the crystal oscillator for the clock. And there's a few interesting little bodges on the bottom, which I pointed out to you in the taking apart of the machine. These resistor packs are actually soldered right on here. And uh, they're on the ISA slots, obviously. They're actually connected to all of these pins here. And then that one is actually connected right there. And the same thing there, even though it looks like it's connected to those two pins, it's not. Now it's cool to see that the bodge wires are still actually attached. This is all pretty haphazard of a mod. The fact is these aren't even attached down. So that's not the best way to do it, but I guess it survived. A little bodge over here as well that uh, goes between those two components. And this is on the memory slot, I think. Or no, that's uh, actually some ICs. The memory slot's on the other side. And looking around the board, you just see there's like areas of corrosion and stuff. It doesn't look terrible. There was a whole lot of like debris and dirt and mud right in this area. So when I hosed this off outside, it, it cleaned it up a little bit, but there's definitely a bit of it left here. You could just see a ton of water and stuff. But it is amazing how well this board survived. And it kind of is the resiliency of these PCBs. If it wasn't for these sockets, and if everything was actually soldered onto the motherboard, it probably would work. We know from the field found like Amiga 500 I worked on, that these sockets here are very difficult when they get corrosion in them. And maybe some deoxid in and out of them is all it's gonna take. So uh, I think the first thing to do is, let me just get this thing connected up to power and we'll see what happens. All right, this is what I'm gonna be using to attempt to power up this board. It's a Pico ATX here connected to this adapter here, which is one of the excellent ATX4VC.com projects. Now this is the older version. I have a newer one that was sent in that has little uh, clips here, which are much better than these screw terminals. I hate these cheap screw terminals, but these are awesome. I've showed these on the channel before. There's a whole bunch of these that are different boards. It's open source and allows you to replace the power supplies on like Macintoshes and Apple IIs and stuff like that with Pico ATX power supplies. And of course it's got fuses and whatnot. It's, it's just an overall great setup. This is one of the older one though, that has all sorts of extra functions like uh, LED fans and things like that, stuff we won't be using. But what this does have is of course it breaks out the minus five, minus 12, five volts and 12 volts. So I have the five volts and the 12 volts hooked up. And I know for sure which is which because I have this connector here, which was one of the Molex connectors and the red wire is definitely in the five volt position. So that's hooked up there. The purple one is the 12 volt. So that leaves us with these three wires, white with stripe, white and orange. Now it should be pretty easy to figure out which are the minus five and minus 12 because those are available on the ISA bus. And I have a little prototype board right here, which breaks out all the various connections here on both sides. 
So there's the minus five and minus 12. Now, unfortunately, I actually cut those wires off and I did that. I didn't want to accidentally clip onto those while I was uh, you know, working. I usually use this for sensing various address lines or data lines or clock signals off the AS ISA bus. That's why this header's on there and there's another one on the back here. But all I really need to do is just plug this into the motherboard like so. Take this power connector here, which um, is not connected to anything, so there's no power on it. Plug this into the motherboard like that. Set the multimeter to continuity mode. And I'm just going to go on this orange wire right here. Make sure we have continuity. Yes, we do. And I'm going to probe the, what, the little cutoff pins here. It's in the sharp probe. And it doesn't seem to be either of those. So let's see about this one. No. How about this one? No. Let's double check that this connector is good. So I'm on one of the red wires here, which should be five volts. Yep, that's good. And the ground wire, which should be this pin. Yep, that's good as well. So we know that's working. How about 12 volts? 12 volts on here goes to this pin. You know what? Maybe I'm not making good contact through the cutoff connector. So let's try from the other side. All right, there we go. 12 volts is connected all the way through. So let's try this white wire right here, see where that goes. So this is minus 12. Aha, okay, it's minus 12. So white is minus 12. Well, that's not minus five. How about this stripe one? Yep, okay. White with stripe, I know you can't really see it, but white with stripe is minus five. And minus 12 is the white wire. Yes, it is, okay. So white minus 12, white with stripe, minus five. Cool. All right, we're hooked up. White to minus 12, white with the stripe to minus five. Ground is on this 3.3 uh, volt, the G side. Red wire is five volts, and this purple wire here goes to 12 volts. That leaves us with this wire here, which essentially needs to be held at five volts just to say, hey, we're all ready to execute. We'll just leave this off for now. We'll see what happens when we power it up like this with the postcard in there, and we'll see what happens. Now, I guess before I power this thing on, I probably the right thing to do is to try to dump, just move that out of the way, try to dump these EEPROMs here, in case something goes catastrophically wrong on this system. All right, I just wrote on these, it's really hard to read. That's odd, that's even. This one is U26 and that one is U32. So let's see about getting these out. I'll do them one at a time. Ah, it's interesting, it's like a flush mount or surface mount socket. Oh boy, these are, uh, yeah, these sockets are precision and they're pretty good normally, but I don't think they enjoyed being exposed to quite so much corrosion as this. So I'm just gonna carefully walk this out. There we go. And there is the chip. Hey, look at that. Compatibility software, Phoenix. Yeah, that's uh, very typical. Phoenix was used on the Tandy 1000 as well. All right, so I have the T48 here. Let's just connect this up. Let's see if this can be read. Hopefully it works. All right, the chips are 27C128. Hey, there we go. That one seems to read fine. So we'll just save that as U32 even. And I'm just getting the other chip out of here. Good, all the legs came out. They were very, very corroded, but hopefully we can still read this one. Okay, here we go. We need to look for that similar string at the top there, licensed to Tandy Corp. Uh-oh. I just reseeded it in the programmer. Oh, it's even worse now. It does seem to change around if I reseed it though, which may indicate that there's just corrosion on the legs. Oh, I think unfortunately this is sort of a harbinger of things to come with this particular machine. I'm going to get the Dremel and I'll try to Polish these up a little bit. See if that makes any difference. I mean, there, this chip is in very bad shape. Okay, did a little bit of polishing there. They're shiny at least. Don't know if that's gonna help the EEPROM programmer here read it. All right, let's try read. Ugh, nope. Same thing. I mean, maybe it's a little bit better. Aha, I pushed on it a certain way and it, Ah, I think that did it. Maybe. Certainly the text there looks good. I'll know if I combine these together because it's an odd and even ROM and we should see a whole bunch of strings. Cool. 
And I use this program here called ROMWAC that allows you to split or join files. So we are gonna byte merge two files. If you have four files, like is one of the options there, that's for 32-bit systems. I mean, this is a 32-bit system, but it would use four 8-bit ROMs. And for whatever reason, this is using two 16-bit ROMs. So we're gonna merge these two files. I don't know which one goes first, but we'll be able to figure that out pretty quickly, I think. And we're gonna output the file to combined A. And that's just because I'll do it twice with the reverse byte order. So there we go, that's combined. And here we go, I'll just do it the other way now. All right, so we have two files here, A and B. So there's the A file and we'll open up the B one here and we'll just look at what it looks like down here for strings. Hopefully we have some strings. Okay, there we go. This looks like this one is reversed. The B one is backwards. If we go to the A one, yeah, look at this. Memory test terminated by keystroke. So that's good. And we have stuff here, data line, odd even logic, double word, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, okay, the A file is the correct combined file. Awesome. Looks like a bunch of blank stuff here near the end. Oh, we got some more text here though. Phoenix Technologies, all rights reserved. All right, there it is. We're running BIOS 1.03.01 from 1987. We'll rename this BIOS file that is the right one. Let me just make sure I got that version number correct. I already forgot what it was. It was down here, there it is. 1.03.01, 1.03.01. Sweet, we got a good dump of the ROM on this system. This might be what, the only dump of the Tandy 4000 ROM that exists out there? You can bet your bottom dollar I'm gonna be uploading this to archive.org. I'll put a link in the description below to that. All right, cool. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to try to power up the computer here without the ROMs installed at all. I'm just gonna put something under here so that doesn't potentially short out. I'm gonna use this power supply here. It's a four amp at 12 volts. Let's plug in our favorite post analyzer card. We'll just stick it in that slot right there. I can hook the speaker up as well. It just reaches. I'll just prop this box under here. That way we can get a look at the LEDs here. You know, I should really rotate this around so I can see the LEDs. All right, there we go. Actually, you know what? I just had a thought. Before we actually apply power, why don't we check for continuity across those rails just to make sure that we don't have any shorts. Ow, got a splinter there. Piece of metal too. All right, so we've got continuity there. Let's just check this. That's fine, that's fine. Five volts is fine and 12 volts, looks good. Okay, no shorts on this motherboard. <laughs> Will this thing work? I don't know, it's gonna be interesting. Now what I need is a jumper to put on there that's gonna power this up. So when I plug this in, yep, we got an LED on there but the thing is not powering up the board. And that's because this is an ATX power supply so we just need a jumper and we'll install that on here for power switch. Actually, this button might do the same thing. Oh, that's weird. Whoa, interesting. All right, I think we might have a short already. <laughs> we didn't a second ago, but notice when I push this, um, this thing comes on and then immediately just shuts off. Now it could be we don't have enough power with the Pico ATX. So in that case, I may need to swap that out with a real ATX power supply, but let's just check these for shorts. Okay, so minus 12 is fine. Minus five is fine. That's ground. Five volts, fine. All right, looks like the 12 volt rail has shorted. Yep, just like that. We went from having no short to having a short. So I'm gonna pop that off of there. Let's just double check one more time. So this is ground right here and the purple wire, yep. That's a dead short. So you just saw it. There was no short, and we went from that to suddenly having a short. We have a whole bunch of tantalums all along the edge here, and I wouldn't be surprised if we have a short on one of these here. That one is the dead short right there. Oh, we got a bunch with a dead short. Okay, I gotta get a marker here. We gotta figure out which is the one with the dead short. To be honest, I should just unplug the 12 volt rail. I don't think it's even necessary for the operation of the computer. All right, that one's reading 0.79. Is that this one right here? Yep. And this one right here. 
All right, mark that one as well. I'm just gonna try to mark all the ones that have a short. It's gonna be one of these. 12 volts is really only used on ISA. It's not gonna be anywhere else on the board. It's very, very unlikely that it makes its way anywhere else. There's no like voltage regulators on here. Let's see about these ones right here. Nope, that one's fine. That one is fine. Just checking in here, nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah, it's just these two, good there. Okay, so it's gonna be one of these two right here. Which one, let's bring the multimeter over here. Which of these two has a lower resistance? So I'm pushing hard down on here because it's oxidized. 0.66, this one here. Uh, 0.66 also. So they are both very close. That one's, that one's higher now. Let's go back to this one. All right, I'm just gonna get to this closer one. So we'll cut that. Now let's check this one. Ah, that's still shorted as well. It could be both of these, to be honest. They are 16 volt caps. That's just too close to 12 volts. It means as soon as this gets powered up, they just went short immediately. I am just gonna leave those out. I'm not gonna even reinstall those right now. There are way too many other things to worry about with this motherboard. That is the least of our problems right there. Let's plug in the post analyzer card like that. And here we go. All right. Well, the system is not running, but remember I said that you have to hook up the power good signal and right now it's not and you take a look at the LEDs, this one here is the reset line, the one that's on the bottom on the left side, and that light is off right now. If my recollection is correct for PCs, it's active low, which means that that should go off when the system is executing. It's currently just held in reset right now, which means there's no way that this thing is gonna do anything. So let's turn this thing back off again. Okay, there we go, look at that. That light is slowly fading. And I have this clip right here on one of the five volt legs of that random TTL chip there. And we have a clip lead hooked up to it right here. And I have a 10K resistor hooked up to the orange wire here, which is the power good signal. And what we're gonna do is when I power on the computer, I'm just gonna clip this on like that. And hopefully the computer then goes out of reset. So we'll start like this with it disconnected. So I'll plug the power back on here. This is on, there we go, turn that on. Okay, the system is just sitting there in reset as far as I'm aware. And let's hook this up. And that did absolutely nothing. <laughs> Let's just try powering on with the resistor already connected there. Yeah, that's not doing a thing. I have the multimeter set for volts. Let's take off the ground right here and just make sure we actually have five volts. Yeah, 4.99 volts on the power good signal. So I think uh, I just was verifying that that 10K resistor wasn't too much for that. Now it is possible the power good signal on this machine needs to be grounded as well. So I guess we could, uh, we could try that. So I have the clip connected to the ground lead now and let's plug this in. And yeah, that made, that made no difference at all. The reset light is still not on. So the system doesn't appear to be actually, whoa! We have a postcode? That's just not possible. Let's press the reset button. Wow, the, it came out of reset for a second there actually pushing the reset button and absolutely nothing is happening. Let's try this again. Now, the thing is, there's no ROMs in this system. So postcodes aren't really possible right now. So I don't really understand what that could even have been. That was just a glitch, if anything. And I noticed in powering this off and on, sometimes this ready light here, I ready is on, sometimes it's off. We have a clock signal apparently. Like there, that, that's actually on now. But reset, that's stuck. I'm gonna end the video here. This seems like a good stopping point. And while there's clearly a lot of work to be done to get this motherboard working, and it's definitely something I wanna try to do, it's a mail call video and it's already been rather long and even I'm kinda losing my voice a little bit by talking so much here. So yeah, it's a good stopping point. Let me know in the comments what you think about this whole computer so far. Um, the, the condition is really, really rough. And I just want to mention, I'm sure there'll be comments about this, like, oh, restore the whole computer. That computer needs the equivalent of like heavy body work, like car body work, if a car were left out in the rust. 
That's not what I do. I work on electronics. <laughs> That's it. So when it comes to repairing that machine, like the sanding it's going to need, the sandblasting, the powder coating, all that stuff to kind of make the case look good again is far beyond anything I could do. If anyone in the local Portland area here wants to take the computer case and the power supply case, the top lid, the bottom, all that stuff from me and try to restore it to make it look as good as brand new again, let me know. The front panel luckily is in good shape. The top lid is actually okay as well, maybe with a good cleaning. It's got a couple little dents and stuff on there, but maybe a little PDR, paintless dent removal, would actually fix that up as well. And then the computer, if the motherboard can be made to work, could actually be put back together. Now, we do have to mention, of course, that, like as I said earlier, that this motherboard is just a commodity motherboard, so there's nothing really that special about it. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if these BIOS chips that I dumped would work in another 3D6 board that has the same chipset as this. I haven't gone to RetroWeb to look up other boards with this chipset, but I know this chips and technology chipset's been used on a whole bunch of other motherboards, so it could easily be these could just work on another motherboard. So that's the only, like, handy special thing about this computer, um, other than the fact that this says Tandy on it. So anyhow, let me know what you think about all of this in the comment section below. And uh, well, Seth, uh, I, I wonder if you realized how bad the condition was of this computer when you sent it. I know you bought this from like an online marketplace listing and perhaps the original seller did not disclose the true condition of this computer. Because I think, uh, you know, if you just took a picture from the front and the top, you might not have really noticed a lot of the rust. It's the underside and the back that looks really bad. So I'll be curious about that, Seth. So yeah, let me know. Uh, send me an email or put a comment or whatever. And uh, yeah, if, if people think that I should definitely work on this motherboard some more and you want to see if I can get this thing working, then let me know. I am very curious and I'm happy to know that the schematics are available. Without those, I might have been, well, not likely to actually try. We do have them. That means that I can try to troubleshoot if there's any bad traces or whatever on here. And yeah, maybe we can get this thing working again. That would be amazing considering how bad the condition was of this thing. But considering that Amiga and the Commodore 64 before it, how bad they were and those things worked, well, I guess anything is possible. The only difference between those computers and this is that they had plastic cases. So the plastic survives the, the weather much better than the metal case of this computer did. And that's that's really the big difference here. So anyways, thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know what to do, all the usual YouTube stuff. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are going up the side of the screen. Thanks to everyone who sent stuff into the mail call. I feel like I'm getting behind on my mail call stuff again. I have so many packages that I haven't opened yet. So I'm trying to start to work my way through it. I just wanted to get this one out of the way, but um, yeah, there's, there's so many more I got to get to. So I'll be doing that soon, hopefully. I just have a bunch of stuff going on, trying to plan for VCFs and this, that, and the other thing. So uh, yeah, that's going to be that. So uh, thanks my patrons. Again, names on the side of the screen, you know, all the usual stuff. So. so thanks again for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.